He had the power and wealth of a king. He was a billionaire, times over. He killed anyone who stood in his way of becoming the world's most powerful drug lord. Pablo was untouchable. He terrorized the nation of Colombia and made an enemy of the most powerful nation on earth. Drug money. He was the crown jewel. He is what we wanted. Pablo Escobar and his cocaine cartel became bigger than his own government. He was the Da Vinci of crime, the bandit of bandits. His empire was vast. He was invincible. He had it all. He had the wealth, the fame. Pablo Escobar became so big that Pablo needed to die. December 2nd, 1993. A team of heavily armed police officers converge on a two-story row house in the Los Olivos neighborhood of Medellin, Colombia. This moment is the culmination of the largest manhunt in history. The United States has devoted all of its intelligence and military assets to finding Pablo Escobar. Hundreds of millions of dollars. Its most elite troops and some of its most secret units. After all this time, all this money and effort and bloodshed, they finally found him. I never really knew that much about Pablo Escobar until I was working on my book, Black Hawk Down. And one day I was interviewing a fellow who was connected with special forces, and he had a picture on the wall of his office of a bloody, dead fat man on a rooftop, surrounded by all these grinning men with rifles. And I interrupted him and said, excuse me, you have to tell me what that is. And he said, that, my friend, is Pablo Escobar. I keep that picture on my wall to remind me that no matter how rich you get in this life, you can still be too big for your britches. And what that suggested to me was that the United States military had been much more involved in hunting down Pablo Escobar and killing him than I had previously thought. Mark Bowden's bestseller, Killing Pablo, uncovered a vicious covert war underwritten by the U.S. government in one of the most violent countries on Earth. Incinerated by nearly 40 years of bloody civil war, Colombians have long been brutalized by both Marxist guerrillas and the right-wing paramilitary death squads who oppose them. A subhuman conflict fueled by a multi-billion dollar trade in cocaine. Colombia's ascension to its place as the kidnapping and terror capital of the world began in a 1950s era of political turmoil. Colombians refer to that period simply as La Violencia, uh, which means just the violence. And there were hundreds of thousands of people killed, and for no real reason. There was no coherent structure to the conflict. It was just Colombia. Sparked by the revolutionary rhetoric of Che Guevara and Fidel Castro, bandits roamed the jungles and perfected the Colombian art of terror. The Colombians themselves have a joke that they tell about how God made their country so beautiful. It's tall Andes mountains, it's tropical jungles, it's beaches, it's fertile soil, that he evened the score by populating their country with the most evil race of men. From the crucible of La Violencia emerged one of the most violent criminals the world would ever see. Pablo Escobar was born in 1949, right in the middle of this period of La Violencia, so his childhood was set in the context of this bloodletting. Escobar's criminal career starts modestly in the 1960s in his hometown Medellin as a small-time racketeer and marijuana dealer. Pablo was a dope smoker from a fairly early age. Colombia was known here in the United States for being a source of some of the strongest, uh, most potent marijuana in the world. America's counterculture establishes a robust market for Colombian marijuana. But it's the arrival of cocaine in the early 70s, which presents a criminal opportunity that would shape the future of Colombia. By the mid-1970s, 
cocaine began to become a more fashionable drug of choice. And this was perfect for a smuggler in Colombia because it's a difference between uh, why carry an elephant when you could put a mouse in your pocket. We have a very big jungle and the countryside has a very little uh, presence by the government and by the state. Most of the area outside the cities is really wild territory. So a certain amount of law and order exists within the cities, but outside the cities in the mountains and in the jungle, there's very little law and order. And it's in that uh, lack of authority and in the, that lack of presence of the state where uh, most of the problems brew, where most of the coca has been growing, where most of the uh, violent conflicts and the violence originates. Well, Pablo Escobar was not a brilliant entrepreneur or organizer. What he was is uh, more violent uh, and ruthless than most of the people who are engaged in this business. And in that way, he was able to consolidate most of the uh, lucrative drug trafficking routes out of Colombia. In 1975, Escobar offers to sell 14 kilos of cocaine to Medellin drug boss Fabio Restrepo. Pablo set up his first deal with Fabio Restrepo. They saw him as a sort of a common street criminal, and they definitely underestimated him. Three weeks later, Restrepo was found dead. And they were informed uh, sort of unceremoniously that they now worked for Pablo Escobar. Pablo introduced a level of violence into the business that they were not used to, and so they were really in over their heads. Escobar expands his business by putting police and judges in his pocket. What Pablo learned about law enforcement from a young age in Medellin was that it could be bought. Those who were determined enough to come after him or honest enough to continue to pursue him and arrest him would be killed. Fueled by America's appetite for the white powder, Escobar's power grows exponentially. He became the king of cocaine, the uh, titular head of the Medellin cartel. And the Medellin cartel had the reputation, well-deserved in my opinion, of being one of the most uh, ruthless, violent, murderous criminal organizations in the world. The Colombian cartels were the one that introduced the drug to the U.S. and sold uh, them in U.S. streets. So they, they had a huge uh, business. Well, Pablo began making uh, more money than certainly anyone in Colombia had ever seen before. He spent his money lavishly on anything that, uh, that struck his fancy. He built an extravagant estate for himself in the middle Magdalena Valley, uh, which he called Napolis. He had a zoo at his, at his ranch. You're talking about Colombia, a guy had elephants, zebras, rhinoceroses. He imported uh, exotic animals, had planes, helicopters. He was invincible. He, he had it all. He had the wealth, the fame. It is a lifestyle Pablo fiercely protects. Colombia was a place where certainly in the underworld, if you wanted to survive, you had to be uh, more feared than your rivals. And so Pablo, cultivated his reputation for violence. One of the stories that I was told is that at a party, at a dinner party at his house, his people caught someone stealing silverware from his kitchen. He had the waiter who stole the silverware bound hand and foot and then kicked him into the swimming pool and had his guests all watch this man drown and announced that this is what happened to anyone who stole from Pablo Escobar. He was a terrible criminal. He used terrorism in a way that Colombia never before uh, had seen. As the Medellin cartel grows in power, Marxist guerrilla movements such as FARC also grow in strength. Even though in his early days, Pablo liked to use Marxist rhetoric, he rapidly became uh, the richest man in Colombia. And as such, he became a target for some of the leftist guerrilla movements in the hills. So Pablo joined with a lot of other wealthy drug traffickers to form their own private armies, uh, paramilitaries, to go after the uh, guerrilla units. Two of the early paramilitary leaders who Pablo worked with were Fidel and Carlos Castaño. My father was kidnapped in the year of 79 by the FARC guerrillas. 
Eh, a Blastern, 180 degrees. De 180 grados, éramos campesinos. With the Colombian government unable to protect its citizens from Marxist guerrillas, Carlos Castaño and brother Fidel establish a paramilitary army called the AUC. Once they cowardly killed my father, I made a decision to fight. They created this organization of paramilitaries with the support of the drug traffickers, primarily the Medellin cartel. This is when my brother Fidel met Escobar and began a friendship with Escobar. The Castañas became uh, allies of the Escobar organization. The paramilitaries were an armed branch of the drug traffickers. Of course, uh, with all the kind of private army he had and a huge amount of money, he became very powerful. Pablo had ambitions to be more than just the wealthiest man in Colombia and its most successful criminal. He wanted to be beloved by the people of Colombia and he wanted to have a legitimate political power. And so he began spending some of his millions on projects for the poor people in Medellin. He uh, funded the building of housing and recreational centers and soccer pitches and embarking on a lot of sort of private welfare programs that uh, something that the government of Colombia would never have done. The objective of Pablo's political campaign, avoiding extradition to the United States. That was the one thing that they feared more than anything. Because whereas in Colombia they could manipulate the justice system by killing judges, by corrupting them, by, by all sorts of coercion, uh, once they got to this country they were just another defendant and they were willing to die rather than go to the United States. In 1982 he was elected to the Congress as an alternate, but the first time he tried to take his seat in the House, he was denounced uh, by the Minister of Justice, Rodrigo Lara, as a notorious drug trafficker and criminal. Escobar's criminal history surfaces in the Colombian press, and his fall from grace is swift. Pablo is banished from the political scene, and many of his assets are seized. Pablo is deeply humiliated by uh, Lara's denunciation, and really from that day forward uh, was at war with the state of Colombia. The U.S. ambassador had warned Lara that his life was in danger, in fact, had given him a bulletproof vest. Three months after taking his stand against Escobar, Lara is tracked by one of Pablo's gunmen. Justice Minister Rodrigo Lara is the first Colombian to take a stand against drug lord Pablo Escobar. April 30th, 1984, Lara is followed from his office by one of Escobar's hired guns. A bulletproof vest provided by the U.S. government is found by his side. With the amount of bullets in his body, it's clear that the vest wouldn't have saved his life anyway. While Lara's killing puts Pablo at war with Colombia, he has yet to become a target for the Americans. Well, initially, Pablo Escobar and the other drug traffickers were uh, cons considered to be sort of romantic, dashing figures. In programs like Miami Vice here in the United States, they were portrayed as somewhat romantic figures. Assuming the risks of drug use was considered to be part of what made it cool. And so it was really uh, the, the hip world against the square world. Uh, the square world was sort of epitomized by the Reagan administration program, which was Nancy Reagan's Just Say No program. Little kids doing drugs, it turns my stomach. Don't mess with them. Just say no. In the early 80s, cocaine begins to transform the landscape of urban America. Public attitudes began to change when cocaine began arriving in the United States in a new form. Instead of being a powder that you sift, it was then now being sold as crack, and it was very inexpensive. And that 
quickly became hugely popular with the poorer classes in the United States and was just a devastating plague in our cities. The change from just normal cocaine to, to crack had a huge uh, impact on, on U.S. policies. It had not only afflicted the people who became addicted to crack, but then these people would set out to steal in order to sustain their addiction. So the cities became plagued by an epidemic of violence and crime. A very high percentage of the murders that take place in the United States are somehow or other connected with uh, cocaine trafficking. And suddenly, people like Pablo Escobar were not seen by everyone as such romantic, dashing figures and became much more perceived as violent criminals. We're striving for a world where... April 1982. Can live happier. In answer to the growing crime rate in America, Reagan signs National Security Directive 221, declaring drug trafficking a threat to national security. Pablo became something much more than a law enforcement problem. He became a real a military target, a real threat to world civilization. As policy shifts in America, Escobar escalates his war against the government of Colombia. At the heart of Pablo's war against the government of Colombia was his fear of extradition. In Colombia, Pablo knew he could bribe or intimidate judges or juries or even prison executives. Uh, in the United States, he knew that, that he couldn't. He had a lot of judges who were against him killed. That was his fight, trying to show Colombia that he was tougher than Colombia. Pablo's policy in his war against the government was called plomo o plato, which means silver or lead. You can accept Pablo's bribe or you can accept his bullets. It was very easy to accept Pablo's bribes. They were generous uh, and reliable. And also the alternative to accepting the bribe was that you, you and your family would be killed. So it became very difficult not to do what Pablo wanted you to do. Escobar was very invincible. In other words, nobody thought you know, they could ever take him down. So people were afraid to talk. They were afraid to go up against him because they know they would end up dead. Pablo was untouchable. You know, he had contacts all over the government and uh, he had access to, to virtually anybody in Colombia. Under those circumstances, it took an extraordinary amount of integrity and courage uh, to go after Pablo Escobar. Among the few who publicly oppose Escobar is General Miguel Maza. General Maza, who was the head of the DAS, which is the equivalent of the FBI in the United States, was probably the one person that was seriously going after Pablo. And Pablo twice tried to assassinate Maza with huge bombs. May 30th, 1989. Escobar targets Maza with a remote detonated car bomb. Maza's car was at the center of the blast. Its wheels were melted to the road, but he managed to kick the door open and step out unhurt. It killed many people. Fortunately, I was spared from death in that attempt. Pablo was trying to kill Maza, and Maza was trying to get Pablo's car. In his obsession to kill Maza, Escobar does not care who gets in the way. 500 kilogram bomb was placed in a bus which was driven in front of the headquarters building of the DAS, which was occupied by Masa, and was detonated. Hundreds of people were injured at that time and about 70 uh, people were actually killed. The carriage of the bus ended up on top of the 11th floor of the building. It is only by the grace of God that General Miguel Massa is here to tell you this story. Escobar wages war on the Colombian judicial system. Pablo paid a guerrilla group called M-19 to invade the Palace of Justice and kidnap basically the entire Supreme Court in Colombia. El M-19. The M-19 went into the courthouse for the purpose of taking and destroying all the evidence against the drug traffickers. Most of the Supreme Court judges were killed. Um, records were destroyed. The government responded to the invasion of the Palace of Justice by invading it, which led to a bloodbath during which 11 of the country's 21 Supreme Court justices were killed. There was no institution that was safe from Pablo Escobar. 
The issue of extradition became a centerpiece of the 1989 presidential campaign. Louis Galan was the leading candidate for president. Galan was campaigning promising to utilize extradition to rid Colombia of drug traffickers like Pablo Escobar. Escobar and his gang decided that uh, Galan was an obstacle, that he shouldn't be president of, of Colombia. August 18, 1989. Galan prepares to deliver a campaign speech in Sochoa, southwest of Bogota. Pablo Escobar targeted him and had him killed. Pablo was responsible for assassinating three of the five candidates for president. The man who took Galan's place was his campaign manager, a man named Cesar Gaviria. This was a very, very difficult period. Escobar was trying to kill me. If he had the possibility of killing me, he would not doubt a second. November 27th, 1989. Presidential candidate Gaviria is scheduled to fly Avianca Airlines Flight 1803 from Bogota to Cali. One of Pablo Escobar's lieutenants is instructed to board the plane with a suitcase he is told contains a listening device. Unbeknownst to Escobar's man, the suitcase is in fact a bomb. November 27th, 1989. In an attempt to assassinate Colombian presidential candidate Cesar Gaviria, cocaine boss Pablo Escobar tricks one of his own lieutenants into carrying what he believes is a listening device aboard the candidate's plane from Bogota to Cali. Avianca Flight 1803 goes down in the mountains outside Bogota. 110 people are killed. There are no survivors. Gaviria, as it happens, was not on the plane. But at the point where Pablo bombed an airplane, he became what the United States considers a clear and present danger. There were two American citizens killed on that plane. So under the long arm statutes, we could prosecute him for the Avianca plane. With cocaine continuing to flow across the borders, American drug policy changes from intercepting drug shipments to taking down cartel leaders became very evident that we had to target them uh, more specifically. As their power grew, it became evident that they had to be dealt with. When George Bush was elected president in 1988, he changed our country's policy against drugs to targeting the drug kingpins, like men like Pablo Escobar. And for the drug kingpins, the death penalty. November 2nd, 1989. President Bush's legal counsel drafts a reinterpretation of the long-standing executive order prohibiting the assassination of foreign nationals. The new interpretation of the prohibition said that if the president of the United States determined that someone was a threat to national security or to the lives of American citizens, that that person could become a target for assassination. Our forces could go out and not just try to find them and arrest them, but actually kill them. America's premier counterterrorism team prepares for a potential mission. Delta Force is the Army's top secret counterterrorism unit that specializes in finding people and going after them and is considered to be one of the best in the world at doing this. Our existence is still not recognized by the Department of Defense. Regardless of whether or not we exist, the unit has some highly motivated, select individuals that specialize in these kinds of operations. As Delta Force stands by, a new group of covert soldiers has already entered Colombia. The CIA had obviously always had a presence in Colombia, but after the Avianca airliner bombing, the Colombian government invited the United States to help them go after Pablo Escobar. The U.S. dispatches a secret surveillance unit, codenamed Centrospike. Centrospike has certain technologies that's highly sensitive. I'm not going to go into what they have or don't have. 
Centra Spike is another top secret army unit that consists mostly of language experts and technicians who specialize in finding people by eavesdropping on their electronic communications and using radio telemetry to target their location. Flying under the cover of an aviation technician team, Centra Spike begins eavesdropping and triangulating phone conversations. One of the things that Centra Spike did was prepare a kind of organizational map. For instance, they would soon know who were the 10 people who Pablo Escobar most frequently spoke to on the phone, and then who were the 10 people that each of those 10 most frequently spoke to. You can form a fairly sophisticated map of the inner workings of an organization. The nucleus of the Medellin cartel was Rodriguez Gacha, a.k.a. El Mexicano, the Ochoa brothers, Fabio, Jorge Luis, uh, Juan David, and Pablo Escobar as the leader. So it was a conglomerate. They would get together. They would borrow each other's airstrips, airplanes, uh, borrow each other's labs. And they were doing loads of coke into Mexico. Then Mexico would bring it to the United States. With Centra Spike flying and listening overhead, the Colombians place a team in Medellin with the dangerous task of acting on Centra Spike intelligence. They created their own special unit of elite uh, police and soldiers called the Bloque de Búsqueda, or the search block, uh, which existed specifically to go after men like Pablo Escobar. Commanding the search block would be the most dangerous job in the most dangerous country on Earth. It was a job that nobody wanted because whoever was going to be in charge of this group going after Escobar would become immediately a target of Escobar's. The man who commanded the search block was Colonel Hugo Martinez. Martinez accepts on the condition that he will be periodically rotated out of the hot seat. It was understood that there was to be a change in personnel every 15 days. However, there was never a change in personnel. I remained on duty the entire time. Hugo Aguilar is selected as Colonel Martinez's right hand. We were chasing after the most dangerous criminal organization in the world, backed by more than a thousand men in uniform from a combination of various Colombian armed forces. As soon as the search block was formed, Pablo Escobar announced that he was going to kill 60 members of the search block in the first month. And then he proceeded to make good on his work. He says he will destroy the search block within eight days. In those eight days, he placed two car bombs, which killed approximately 25 police officers. In the first weeks of the search block's efforts, scores of the men were killed. There were times when we would feel powerless before such a criminal. Though the Colombian government considers disbanding the search block, Colonel Martinez asks for and receives more men and continues targeting Escobar's organization. The first of the drug traffickers that Centra Spike targeted and found was Rodriguez Gacha. When the Centra Spike located Gacha on a hilltop, Finca, just outside of Bogota, they turned over this information to the Colombian government. Gacha and three of his associates are gunned down in a battle with Colombian forces. Gacha went down fighting, I mean, uh, you know, shooting at the police. Escobar would soon lose more vital assets. Centra Spike enabled the uh, search block uh, to target uh, a lot of the key people right around Pablo Escobar. They started arresting people, they started killing people. The search block began killing or arresting uh, the, the top people around Pablo, including his longtime uh, associate and his cousin, Gustavo. And Gustavo Gaviria was the brains behind the Medellin cartel. Escobar remains unaware that Centra Spike is listening in from above. Centra Spike got to be so effective that Pablo came to suspect that he had 
an informer in his inner circle. So he began torturing and killing people around him who he suspected of uh, collaborating with the authorities. What he didn't realize was that the information was being provided by the secret American unit center spike. Escobar was not the only one who operated by violence. All of these uh, hitmen and associates of Escobar were killed in what the police would euphemistically call shootouts with the uh, police. Colonel Martinez or his troops may have gone to the extreme, but this wasn't a normal criminal that they were after. Pablo Escobar rates right up there with Adolf Hitler. This is a man that's responsible for thousands and thousands of deaths of innocent people. The search block was a 700-man SWAT team, and you can't run an operation like that without it, it being violent. They were being shot at and killed all the time. This was a war. It was an armed confrontation between the Medellin cartel and the state. Desperate for an advantage in his war against the state, Pablo begins kidnapping Colombian dignitaries. I was kidnapped on uh, September 19, uh, 1990. I was um, a classical kidnapping in which a couple of cars, three cars blocked your car. They killed uh, my driver. He was doing that to exert his power and show the Colombian government, the Colombian people, that he could get to anybody. Escobar will use his hostages to negotiate the terms of a surrender. Escobar decided that what he needed was a comfortable, secure base of operations where he and his associates could live, uh, be protected from their enemies, from members of the Cali cartel, from the Colombian search block and the Colombian National Police, uh, from the United States. In, in case he was captured, he would use us as, as, as bargaining chips. As Escobar negotiates with the Colombian government, the hostages remain in the hands of his sicarios. I was kept um, in a very small room. I was chained to a bed, I had four guards. It's an experience in which uh, you survive by the second. When you're in the hands of Pablo Escobar, you don't know what's gonna happen, you know? You can be dead the next second, so I didn't have any illusions of surviving. I thought I was gonna die. January 24th, 1991, Pablo executes one of his hostages. Days later, another is killed in a rescue attempt. That was the toughest point. I cried a lot. Uh, I got used to, to knowing that uh, maybe the next day would be my last day. At this point, Pablo is literally running from hideout to hideout, knowing that if Colonel Martinez catches up to him, he's going to be killed, uh, but at the same time not wanting to uh, surrender until the terms had been worked out to his satisfaction. Pablo is playing a very dangerous game with the Colombian government. He felt the pressure. He knew we were getting very close. Al presidente se le the president was warned about the danger in negotiating with Pablo Escobar. Sin embargo, but he went right ahead. Adelante. The deal that Pablo made with the government of Colombia was he would discontinue his violent campaign against the state in return for being able to build his own prison on a mountaintop just outside of Medellin called La Catedral. May 20th, 1991. As a concession towards his private sanctuary, Escobar releases his remaining hostages. I couldn't believe it. They took me to the street. They gave me money for a, a cab. And finally, a guy uh, picked me up and I told him, uh, please take me back home. As part of Pablo's deal, General Maza is removed from his case. With construction underway on Escobar's private prison, one last demand must be met. They actually held a Continental Congress, basically, uh, where they rewrote the Constitution of Colombia to ban extradition. Y el día que la and the day that the amendment to an extradition was put into the Constitution, 
ese día Pablo Escobar turned himself in. He held a press conference on the mountaintop outside the prison and graciously announced that he decided to uh, end his war against Colombia. Le mandó a decir, he sent this message. Tell President Gaviria, I will not let him down. The agreement was thus sealed. I personally viewed it, along with my colleagues working on the search, as having been defeated. He knew we were close to getting to him, and this was his way out. To us, it was a defeat. We had lost, and he had won. Even as Pablo is incarcerated in La Catedral, he sends a message to Colonel Martinez. They discovered a bomb that had been planted by one of Pablo's hitmen. Pablo's deal with the government of Colombia evidently didn't include uh, ending his war against Colonel Martinez. In 1992, with Colombian cocaine boss Pablo Escobar serving time in his own prison at La Catedral, no one in Colombia is breathing easy. It was a different kind of prison in the sense that he wasn't actually required to stay there. Uh, he would frequently turn up at soccer matches in Medellin or Christmas shopping in Bogota. I've been in a lot of prisons in my 26 years, and uh, this is definitely not cl classified as a prison. A resort would be a more accurate way to describe La Cathedral. They would bring truckloads of uh, friends and prostitutes uh, to party with them. He built a discotheque inside of the prison, which was used as the party room. My favorite part of the deal was that uh, the Colombian National Police, i.e. Colonel Martinez and his search block, were not allowed within 20 kilometers of the prison. Um, we made a huge mistake. We underestimated the capacity of Escobar for corruption and intimidation. Disastrous. Disastrous. You could not negotiate with Pablo Escobar. Pablo Escobar was a psychopath, a mentally sick individual. And he proved it. Pablo got set up in La Catedral and began to reconsolidate his hold over the cartel. In fairly short order, he built the Medellin cartel back up to where it was exporting more cocaine than it ever had in its history. He was still doing his same old activities of ordering the killings of people, of sending dope. Uh, so nothing had changed except that now he was safer. Some of his subordinates had begun basically running the organization for themselves and apparently had been helping themselves to uh, large portions of the profits. Two of the associates who were doing this, the heads of the Galeano and the Mancata families, were invited up to the prison for a chat with Pablo. Pablo had them both executed. I'm declaring a Fujimori. In other words, I'm taking over. I am uh, taking over the government, and uh, I am the boss now. I run everything. President Gaviria had put up with a lot of the criticism of his deal, but the embarrassment of putting Pablo up in such luxury and giving him such relative freedom finally uh, reached a turning point when he learned of the executions inside the prison. And so he was, he was like running his business from Yale, and uh, he gave orders to, to move him to Bogota. Ambassador Morris Busby receives the news while back in the States. The phone rang, and it was Janet Crist, who was the political counselor, and she said the president has moved against uh, Escobar. Uh, he has sent a military team up to Envigado, and they're going to take him out of the prison. He made the decision that they had to move Pablo from his self-built prison to a real one. Eduardo Mendoza, who was a vice minister of justice for Colombia, was sent up with the army unit just to observe. But, of course, Escobar found out about this before they got there. With Escobar aware of their plans, the army refuses to enter the prison. Mendoza took it upon himself to go in the prison to negotiate with Escobar to try to reassure him that he really was just going to be transported to a different prison. And um, well, things went badly. Escobar got very angry with him and said this was a violation of his agreement 
with the president and basically took Mendoza captive inside the prison. Justice Minister Mendoza is held at gunpoint inside Escobar's living quarters. While Mendoza was being held captive in the prison, Pablo's men kept threatening to kill him. As the standoff continues through the night, President Gaviria calls in the Colombian Special Forces. Time was passing, and we need to do it. In the early morning hours, they assaulted the prison. Mendoza, in the confusion, was corralled by one of the Special Forces sergeants that threw him to the ground and basically sat on him and then directed him on how to run out of the line of fire and managed to escape with his life. It was incredible what happened. I was indignant and furious because I did not understand, and I do not today. Several hours later, Janet called again and said there, there has been a real fiasco. Um, the whole operation was a failure. They discovered that Escobar had escaped. Escape is not the correct word. He walked out of the prison. He controlled the guards. He controlled everything. I think he had like 12 of his best assassins staying with him, and they all escaped that night. The Americans associated with this mission were delighted that Pablo had escaped because while he was in prison, they hadn't been able to go after him at all. Now that he was free, it opened up the possibility of targeting him again and killing him. We were elated because the hunt was on again, and we knew we were going to get him. President Gaviria makes a plea to the U.S. Embassy. Gaviria had said to me, um, you know, I don't know what restrictions you've been operating under, under the, in this country up to the present time, but I'm telling you right now, we need your help. There are no restrictions. I asked full, full cooperation of the U.S. in this matter. We needed to find Escobar. He asked Ambassador Busby for a military help, and the first thing that occurred to Busby was Delta Force. He made a request to Washington to bring Delta Force to Colombia to help lead and train the Colombian forces to go after him. We got some assets into the country. We got a lot of very, very competent people that came to Colombia literally within hours. All kinds of groups were there. The unit, the agency, Central Spike, all to provide support for the Colombian command. I always believed that we had a very, very good shot at finding Escobar in the early going. He was the crown jewel. He is what we wanted. Delta Force places two operators at La Catedral. While Centra Spike would put their ears on the target, Delta Force would put their eyes on it. Centra Spike and Delta Force were able to pinpoint Escobar's location literally days after he'd escaped from prison. By the time the Colombian forces act on the American intelligence, Pablo has vanished. In order to be successful with Pablo, it had to be very time sensitive because if we got intelligence that Pablo Escobar was at location X last night, chances are he wasn't there anymore. As Escobar's trail grows cold, a decision is made to reform the original search block. This time, it will have the full support of the United States law enforcement, intelligence, and counterterrorism agencies. Peña and Murphy went to live in, in Medellin with the task force. I mean, they, that's, that was their second home. This search block was now more organized, uh, had more of a focus, had more intelligence, had better equipment to start the second search for Escobar. With corruption and fear permeating the Colombian forces, there is one clear choice for commander of the new search block. I did not ask to be reassigned to head the operations. But when he escaped from La Catedral, my immediate thought was, this represents an opportunity to finish the job. He was one of the few Colombian police officers that was not afraid of Pablo Escobar. And he was completely obsessed with getting Pablo. So a decision was made to, uh, to bring Colonel Martinez back. They spent the latter part of uh, 1992 basically training 
Martinez and his men to be more effective, basically to be a proxy Delta force in this effort to get Escobar. The search block immediately begins launching daring raids throughout Medellin. It was very stressful. I mean, it's one of the most stressful, I guess, dangerous points in my life. You gotta remember that we were going after probably one of the world's most dangerous persons. Through his lawyers and the press, Escobar desperately tries to reclaim his deal with the government. But this time, there will be no deal. We all the time say, he can only give up. We will not guarantee him anything. And it was very clear to everyone involved that the intention was no longer to arrest Pablo, to bring him to justice or put him in prison. At this point, they were just looking for him to kill him. In 1992, despite the full cooperation of the American forces in the hunt for Pablo Escobar, the drug boss remains at large and protected by his powerful Medellin cartel. Escobar was the head of a very large criminal organization, so he employed not just uh, gunmen and hitmen and criminals, but also bankers and lawyers and accountants. He had an infrastructure in Medellin, so we started targeting other members of his organization. We began to systematically cut away all of his support mechanisms, all of his infrastructure. We built up a large body of intelligence, put together organization charts down to the lowest lieutenant in his organization. Escobar responds by putting a price tag on the head of Medellin police officers. He was killing regular police officers, nothing to do with the search block, just a regular police officer on the beat. Every day there were funerals for policemen that were killed the night before. Pablo was able always to stay one step ahead of the search block because he had a lot of friends and informants, both in the community and also within the search block itself. There was a lot of information that was being intercepted, which suggested a lot of people on the take. If you didn't take the money, he would shoot you. you know, plata or plomo. You know, you want a bullet or you want some money. We knew that we could be infiltrated. The Medellin cartel members were constantly looking for someone they could bribe monetarily. It became apparent to the Americans and to the Colombians searching for Escobar that the tactics they were using were never going to be successful. In the days after Escobar's escape from his private prison in July of 1992, the DEA had toured the site in search of any intelligence that they could possibly use against the drug lord. We went through the prison where he had lived, found great intelligence, uh, just great information. One of the things that they noticed about Escobar as they examined his living quarters and his memorabilia was how much his life revolved around his family and his children. I was always of the opinion that we should watch his family, track his family, because he had the reputation of being uh, an absolutely ruthless, murderous man, but the man who really had great regard for his family, for his wife and his two children. Ambassador Busby shared his thoughts with the Colombian authorities. I talked to the Colombians about that and said, you know, I think this will make him uneasy and perhaps have him you know, stick his head up and we'll be able to see him. January 30th, 1993. A 220-pound car bomb explodes in front of a bookstore in downtown Medellin. It killed scores of people, many of them children, shopping for school supplies. And I think it was really the point at which the gloves came off in the search for Pablo Escobar. In the subsequent days, more bombs go off in Colombia. This time, however, the bombs are targeting Pablo's family. A bomb blows up a 12-story apartment building owned by Pablo's mother. Soon, another Escobar house is decimated. An organization calling itself Los Pepes came out of the woodwork. A mysterious entity begins targeting Pablo's organization and even his family for outright assassination. 
Los Pepes, which stood for, in its acronym, People Persecuted by Pablo Escobar, suddenly burst on the scene, targeting and assassinating anyone who was associated with Escobar. It had the earmarks of a psychological operation of some sort. But it got very quickly beyond that, and it became a murderous bloodbath. People being killed by the Pepe's almost every night. They ran the whole gamut of crimes. So in reality, Los Pepe's were just as ruthless as Escobar. Anybody who had uh, any connection with Escobar was either killed, arrested, or running for their lives. Personally, I thought he was going to taste of his own medicine. Let's just call another flank he had to worry about. The police, you know, never did stuff like this. I mean, he was always worried about the police, but now you have Los Pepes playing uh, outside the rules. They started to play dirty, just like Escobar. They were killing as many as five and six people a day. They would assassinate these people and leave signs hanging around the neck of the body, uh, signed Los Pepes. While Los Pepes is exterminating Escobar's support structure, the search block takes down some of Pablo's top lieutenants, such as Tyson Munoz. The search block raided the apartment, cornered Tyson, and killed him in the proverbial gun battle with the Colombian police. The confrontation was pretty much inevitable because these people were not going to be taken alive. In my opinion, the police did not want to take him alive either because the wheels of justice don't work in Colombia the way they do in the United States. Despite an official prohibition, many of the American forces are rumored to be participating in the search block raids. Delta Force operators and the DEA agents very frequently went along on these raids and often led them. We couldn't stand back and feed this in, them this information about a potential Escobar hideout and expect them to go out and participate in all the dangerous activities while we sat in the rear, you know, and drank our coffee and waited for them to come back and report to us. So Javier and I decided ourselves that we would be involved in these operations. We're right there on the front lines with the guys, running in, kicking the doors, going in, participating right alongside the Columbia National Police. With Americans funding, training, and possibly even participating in search block raids, concern grows over a possible connection between the search block and the death squad, Los Pepes. There were allegations on the part of Pablo that um, Los Pepes and Martinez were one and the same. I was very much afraid of somehow DEA being contaminated by what was going on out there. There's been accusations that members of the Bloque de Busqueda provided information to Los Pepes. Did I ever see that? No. Did I ever see any indication that that happened? No. Could it happen? Sure, it could happen. You know, there's 600 guys in that operation. It's still something of a mystery uh, who Los Pepes were. And that's obvious because the Los Pepes were basically murdering people. One of the few to admit to participating in the killings is Escobar's former ally, Carlos Castaño. Los Pepes is an organization that arose supported by the Auto Defenses. Yes, particularly by my brother Fidel Castaño, but he was bigger. Carlos Castaño and his brother Fidel were some of the original paramilitary units uh, created to fight against the guerrillas. When Escobar began executing members of his own organization inside his private prison, La Catedral, the survivors began to secretly ally themselves with Pablo's paramilitaries against the drug lord. Pablo Escobar killed most of his friends and allies and his pals. But there were relatives that survived that lunatic and they joined us. The drug trafficker said, we're sick and tired of this guy, we're going after him. And they created the Pepes, and they attacked him exactly the way he used to work against society and against them. We realized that he was a monster that we had to fight against no matter what. So when they turned against him, they knew the inner workings of his organization. They knew who the people were, where the money was. Los Pepes reportedly received support from Pablo's chief business rival, the Cali Cartel. 
The Cali cartel was more than happy to help Los Pepes or the search bloc or the Colombian government go after Escobar because he was their primary rival. And by eliminating the Medellin cartel, it just made for a more lucrative business for them. Colonel Martinez and the U.S.-backed search bloc are rumored to be cooperating with Los Pepes. Colonel Martinez was at this point, even though he denies it, I think, uh, was willing to work with these elements from the underworld because for him, uh, the battle with Escobar had become very personal. You could say that Escobar affected all of us who were Los Pepes members. When things started to get really ugly, when Los Pepes began killing people wholesale, it was clear to the Americans working in Bogota that this was out of bounds. And if word got back to Washington that the United States effort was connected in any way to these death squads, then Washington would basically pull the plug on American involvement. This threw something into the game which, which really could have brought everything to a grinding halt. Mark Bowden's Killing Pablo cites classified cables outlining the American concerns about Los Pepes. While the United States Embassy in Bogota maintained the pretense that there was no connection whatsoever between Colonel Martinez's search bloc and Los Pepes, I came across the DEA's uh, cable traffic back and forth from Bogota to Washington, which documents the knowledge of DEA agents that uh, Los Pepes were intimately involved with the search bloc. Ambassador Busby himself wrote a rather lengthy cable to Washington where he details the fact that their own intelligence showed that there was a connection between Los Pepes and the search bloc. In fact, Ambassador Busby had gone to President Gaviria to complain about this and to demand that this connection cease and desist. I had uh, several meetings, and one of them, I want you to say, every member of the police, that we don't, that this is not an instruction, that this is not the policy, that we, don't, we shouldn't be involved in that. Days after Gaviria's orders to the police, Los Pepes issue a press communique announcing they are officially disbanding. And in effect, for a period of time, Los Pepes did cease and desist. So it was obvious that they understood that, that there was a connection between the police and Los Pepes. Though officials moved to distance themselves from the vigilante group, Los Pepes continued their bloody campaign. Los Pepes were the first tactic employed against Escobar that was immediately effective. Uh, in short order, everybody associated with Escobar, his family members, his lawyers, his bankers, his accountants, were either running for their lives or, or dead or under arrest. And, and, and very quickly, Pablo began to uh, find that his protective shell was disintegrating. We confronted Escobar's terrorists. There were a lot of killings during this confrontation. We could see that the impact that they were having was incredible because they were playing without any rules. Officially, the United States was not involved in the efforts of Los Pepes at all. But if you look at what they were doing in Colombia at the time, it's clear that they were working hand in hand with Los Pepes, whether they intended to or not. It was very evident that they were having tremendous success in dismantling the Medellin organization. And obviously, you know, we were trying to do the same thing. There was a strategy, wide, perfect, outlined by the United States, by these agencies, in which tacitly each one did what each one had to do. By February of 93, Los Pepes have killed dozens of Escobar's associates and members of his extended family. So Pablo is now terrified that Los Pepes are going to kill his wife and children. I got a phone call, um, almost a frantic phone call, from uh, the Minister of Defense who said um, Escobar's wife and children and an entourage of 12 or 14 people are at the Rio Negro airport and they have visas to go to the United States and they're going to leave the country. If he succeeded in getting his family out of the country, there would be no inhibitions on him and there was no telling what he might do. The Escobar family and their bodyguards are met at Rio Negro airport by U.S. DEA agents. They were stopped at the airport in Bogota 
and stripped of their visas. Who's going to tell me to give Escobar's family's visas back? Nobody. So they're effectively keeping the bait, the bait being the family, in position in the country while Los Pepes apply the pressure against Escobar. Pablo's response to the American's block would be swift and deadly. April 1993, with his family prevented from fleeing Colombia and forced back into the hands of the death squad Los Pepes, cocaine king Pablo Escobar exacts his revenge. Pablo's response was to set off a 300-pound bomb in Bogota that leveled a city block. One of the predictions that we had made was that as we began to tighten the noose on Escobar, things would get more violent, that he would react. And he certainly did. I think we had nine bombs in Bogota in the space of about two months. Hundreds of people killed. Los Pepes responded by kidnapping and murdering Pablo's chief lawyer, Guido Parra. And when they killed Parra, they also took his teenage son and murdered him too. They hung signs around their neck that said, what do you think of the exchange for the bombs, Pablo, and signed them Los Pepes. Despite allegations that Colonel Martinez is cooperating with Los Pepes, he is kept on as commander of the search block. Colonel Martinez stood up and did the job that had to be done. Nobody else wanted to do it. A lot of people were afraid to do it. Colonel Martinez realized that the fight between him and Pablo Escobar was a fight to the death. And at the end, either he or Pablo Escobar was going to be dead. With Centra Spike finding no sign of Pablo's voice on the airways for months, Colonel Martinez requests the support of a Colombian ground surveillance unit. The Colombian National Police were having a lot of success with a small unit that operated portable direction finders in collaboration with Centra Spike. And Colonel Martinez uh, requested that this unit come to Medellin. Martinez receives the unit, but he insists on sending one of its members back home to Bogota. His superiors sent him to me on two occasions. And on both occasions, I sent him back because he bears my name. The problem was that his own son was one of the men working in this unit. I knew that my equipment would work and we could get good results in Medellin. But he was always resistant to my working in Medellin for my safety. He insisted that he wanted to be involved in the search for Pablo Escobar. It had become a personal as well as familial problem that was affecting us all. Hugo Jr. was determined to be uh, with the unit and get Pablo Escobar before he could, he could get him, or his sisters or brothers or his mother. Sin embargo, after a lot of talking, we came to the conclusion that I could stay in Medellin. We could get no more rest until we captured him. With Escobar's family under police watch in Medellin, Pablo's own son becomes his father's front man. He talked to Juan Pablo uh, just about every day by radio phone, and Juan Pablo became the one person who he trusted, who he could communicate with to do his bidding uh, with the government. While Pablo strategizes with his son, Colonel Martinez's son tries to pinpoint the transmission. I was very sure that I would find Pablo Escobar with this equipment. As the hunt for Escobar gets new life, Rumors continue to cloud the search block. Known members of the Medellin cartel are seen meeting with search block officers outside the search block base, including a notorious assassin. An individual that uh, we knew only as Don Bernardo at that time, and I'll admit we did interview him. The Colombian National Police brought him as an, uh, in as an informant, and he provided information about Escobar and his associates. Uh, it was uh, one of those things that happened in a, in a dirty war. There were lots of informants. I can't say, you know, if they were part of those papers or not, but there were informants. Among those working as a secret informant for the Colombian police 
is Carlos Castaño. I provided information to the police under the code name Alecos. They never knew I was Carlos Castaño, leader of the paramilitaries. We're not afforded the luxury of having informants who are priests. Bloque de Busquets was the good guys. The narcotics traffickers were the bad guys. Washington also becomes concerned about a possible connection between Los Pepes and Delta Force. The tactics being employed by Los Pepes were basically the same tactics that Delta Force was in Colombia teaching to the search block. There had been a lot of comments that the Pepes were using like tactics. From what I had heard, they were just ruthless. There's no tactics behind that shit. They just whacked people. Anyway, they were very efficient. In Washington, the fear was not just that uh, members of the Colombian search bloc who had been trained by Delta Force were, in fact, moonlighting as members of Los Pepes, but that Delta Force operators themselves might be participating in these hits. November 12, 1993. The CIA briefs the Pentagon on suspicions of a connection between Delta Force and Los Pepes. A decision is made to pull all American forces from Colombia. I did get word that we were going to be told that our military units were going to be pulled out. And um, I certainly didn't want that to happen. Ambassador Busby was then able to go to work with his connections in the White House to counterman the Joint Chiefs order to remove the people from Colombia, and they stayed. As Busby buys the search block precious time, surveillance teams continue to crisscross Medellin. In late November of 1993, the uh, search block, with the help of Centrospike, was able to pinpoint Pablo's location to a hilltop finca outside Medellin. Intelligence had been received that indicated that Escobar was hiding in a small house located on the side of a mountain out in rural areas. When the assault forces hit the house, they burst in and Pablo wasn't there. In fact, Pablo had been talking on the radio, but he would walk up into the woods a short distance from the house so that he'd have a better line of sight uh, communications with his son Juan Pablo in Medellin. So when the search block descended on the farmhouse, Pablo was actually up in the woods. The search block examined the uh, farmhouse where Pablo had been staying, and it was apparent to them that the drug kingpin was living under increasingly strained circumstances. Virtually his entire organization, the Medellin cartel, was totally destroyed. One of the few remaining links to Pablo's empire is his son, Juan Pablo. The Escobar family was staying in a um, apartment in Medellin, and Los Pepes were sort of picking off people who worked for the family. So they were pretty terrified. Pablo is really desperate. His family is literally in the hands of his enemies. We always had his family under watch 24 hours a day, so he could never touch our families because if he does, his family would also perish. He was always worried about his family's security because that is where the Pepes concentrated their attack efforts, his family. November 27, 1993. Scheming with his son, Juan Pablo, Escobar makes a secret arrangement to evacuate his family to Germany. And word of this, uh, of course, gets back to the embassy because Centrospike is listening to all of Pablo's communications. We learned that they were traveling on a Lufthansa flight from Bogota to Germany. So the United States government goes to work with the Colombian government to assure that the German authorities will not allow the Escobar families into that country. Escobar's families refused entry into Germany and flown directly back to Colombia. They put them up in Hotel Tequendama, which is a large hotel complex in Bogota that's actually owned by the Colombian National Police. And so while publicly they claimed to be protecting Pablo's family, the way that Pablo saw it was that his family had now fallen into the hands of the very people who were likely to kill them. Sure enough, it wasn't a day before Escobar called. When he made the first phone call, I thought, okay, he's, he's finished. Once again, their efforts to get out of the country had been uh, stopped. 
That's when he started making mistakes. When Pablo Escobar begins to make phone calls to the Hotel Tequendama, we placed everybody in a state of alert. They called the presidential palace in an effort to speak to President Gaviria, threatening to wage all-out war against the state unless they released his family and allowed them to leave Colombia to a safe haven. He started calling everybody. Uh, and that's where he made the mistake of staying in one place too long. And at this uh, critical moment, the government of Colombia announces that they're going to remove the protective detail from around the Escobar family. I mean, it was not fair to have so many Colombians at risk, uh, and at the same time having this man with nothing to lose. At this point, just to ratchet up the pressure on Escobar, Los Pepes made a public announcement that they were going to resume their murderous campaign against him. We were closing in on Escobar. We made him get to a point where he had to abandon his bodyguards and he was reduced to hide out almost alone. With the exception of Pablo's family, every resident of the hotel has fled for fear of being caught in the crossfire between Pablo Escobar, the search block, and the Pepe's death squad. The fear is so palpable that little Manuela, who was then eight years old, was overheard walking the halls of the empty hotel, singing a little Christmas carol to herself that she'd changed the words to, and the words that she was singing were, Los Pepe's are going to kill my father, my mother, and me. December 1993, on the run and at war with the state of Colombia, Pablo Escobar tries to protect his family from the vigilante death squad, Los Pepes. He's desperate to get his family out of Colombia, so he has to continue making phone calls to the Hotel Tequendama. While Pablo is on the phone talking, uh, Centrospike is listening in, and they fix his location to a neighborhood in Medellin called Los Olivos. Colonel Martinez positioned a lot of his men in parking lots in that neighborhood so they would be poised and ready to move the next time Pablo came up on the radio. Hugo Martinez Jr. and the rest of the search block wait for another Escobar phone call. Every time Pablo got on the uh, radio telephone with his son, Hugo Jr. would be cruising the streets in his uh, telemetry van trying to zero in on the precise location of the phone call. My father was very clear, saying that the operations cannot go on if Pablo was not talking. Desperate for a way out, Pablo turns to his son, Juan Pablo. Pablo woke up in the morning of December 2nd, the day after his uh, 44th birthday, and had spaghetti for breakfast, and then uh, immediately got on the phone with his son, Juan Pablo. Escobar agrees to answer a phone interview through his son. He instructs his son to accept a list of questions from journalists with the intention of uh, giving interviews that will play on the heartstrings of the Colombian public the fact that the government is using his wife and children as bait. Juan Pablo asked his father for some coaching on how to answer the questions. He also warned Pablo that uh, there were a lot of questions, so this conversation might take a long time. He tells Juan Pablo that they'll get back on the phone a few hours later. This, of course, uh, gave a tip-off then to uh, Colonel Martinez and his men that they could be waiting and in position for the phone call that was going to happen later in the day. Indeed, he called again. We were already located in a house near the zone from where he first called. Hugo immediately started tracking the signal. And the search block followed him out into the city. He's looking at a little monitor uh, that has a line stretched across it. And, as he, and the line either contracts or expands, depending on whether he's getting closer or getting further away. And initially, he locates it in a building where he thinks Pablo must be speaking and the search block launches a raid on this building. But immediately upon launching the raid, Hugo Jr. realizes that he's made a mistake. I read the instruments wrong. They went inside, and I realized he was still talking, and I was very surprised. I had to look again at the instruments, and I found out that there were things that produced an error in the reading. The signal is bouncing off of water in a little canal running down the side of the street. 
When I realized this and made the subtractions, the arrow changed immediately. So he radios to the search block that he's made a mistake, and he races off thinking that the troops will then get back in their vehicles and follow him, but in fact, no one hears him. So Hugo Jr. and his driver are driving off by themselves, hunting down this signal, and manages to drive right down the correct street in Los Olivos, where uh, Pablo is staying. Y él seguía hablando. He started talking again, and I followed the signal to the point where the equipment showed me the exact location he was in. I turned around and passed by the front again. And with the radio in my hand, I put my hand out the window and started pointing at the window in the second floor. At the same time that I was pointing, I observed the silhouette of Pablo Escobar with the phone in his hand. I was listening, and he looked through the window. We saw each other. He calls me and tells me, I have located him with zero margin of error. Furthermore, he tells me, I'm looking at him. And Colonel Martinez immediately tells him, don't go anywhere. I tell them that they should wait for the search block, but they had to confront him to do so. And so Hugo went around to the back of the building, and the, some of the men with him staked out the front door. Pablo Escobar, estuvo muy Pablo Escobar was very calm. We did not see him trying to make an escape attempt. He was very still, maybe waiting for luck to help him again. But this time he was surrounded. Hugo Aguilar's team reaches the scene and immediately makes the assault. Pablo hadn't noticed anything peculiar and was still talking on the phone with his son Juan Pablo when the explosive charge went off on the door downstairs. We began going up the stairs. I was up front. Pablo Escobar said, there is something going on here. I'll call you back. And he threw the telephone. He ran to the window, and he went into the abyss. Escobar's lone bodyguard, Lamont, is the first to reach the window. The man that was with Pablo Escobar came out of the house. He jumped, and he hit it in our direction, shooting. Lamont attempted to race across the rooftop and was apparently shot on his way across the roof. The force of his momentum carried him right off the roof and he landed on the grass uh, behind the garage. And then Pablo Escobar appeared. He had two guns in his hands. Pablo began trying to inch his way out along a wall that bordered the rooftop, looking for some avenue of escape. He was talking to the police with such rage and shooting in and out of the house. When he was against the wall, we were not able to get a line of fire to hit him. He started walking to the front. And since the roof goes up, we started seeing more of his body. And at that moment, he fell. When the firing stopped, I looked and I saw him lying on the roof. I took the radio and said, Viva Colombia, Pablo Escobar is dead. The world's most powerful criminal was dead. But just how Pablo Escobar died would remain clouded in mystery. December 2nd, 1993. Drug Lord Pablo Escobar is gunned down on a rooftop in Medellin, Colombia. Javier, they just killed Escobar. Like, what? <laughs> he just killed in Medellin. It's all over the press. So, I mean, I was happy. I was elated. I became static. I ran around our office space, you know, saying, hey, Pablo's dead. Immediately, I traveled to the location with DEA agent Steve Murphy. I was given the opportunity to go down on the roof to view the body, 
to visually confirm that it was Escobar. And he climbed to the rooftop and began taking pictures. Members of the search block posing around the body with rifles like big game hunters. Murphy then gave the camera to uh, the search block and they took pictures of him posing with Escobar's body. Photos of an American agent posed over the dead body caused an uproar in Colombia, where many were unaware that gringos were in on the hunt. It is true that we Americans provided a lot of assistance to the Colombians. Uh, we, we certainly did that. But in the last analysis, the success was Colombia's. It was a Colombian operation from start to finish. Colonel Martinez, Colonel Aguilar, these guys are truly great heroes in, uh, in Colombia history. Yo creo que... I believe I have performed a great service to my country. At the end, I considered a victory for the world. While there was no question that Pablo was marked for death, how he died remains a subject of conjecture. The official version of Pablo's death is that he came running out from that wall across the rooftop with a gun in each hand, you know, screaming at the police and swearing at them as they, as they gunned him down. El tiro de, de la pistola the shot from my gun was the one that perforated his heart. And the one from the R-15 went through one of his ears and came out through the other ear. That is why we were able to end the story of Pablo Escobar. It may be true, but Pablo's usual modus operandi in these circumstances was not to stand and fight, but to flee. And so it seems more likely to me that Pablo, hearing the door being broken down in his house, would have tried to jump out the back window and run away. What makes sense to me is that Pablo was trying to run away across the rooftop when he was hit. He was shot three times. One of the bullets hit him in the leg, one of them hit him in the torso, and the third went right in his right ear. It's definite that the bullet that went in his right ear killed him. What makes more sense to me is that the bullets that hit his leg and his torso would have knocked him down, certainly, uh, and that the final shot that killed him was most likely administered by somebody standing right over top of him. I would not, I mean, I would not put it past the cop going up there and just say, hey, we're going to make sure this guy's dead. I think he was shot up close. They wanted to make sure he was dead. Whoever it was knew he wasn't to be taken alive. There have been uh, a lot of accusations that um, there was a, a coup de grace shot after Escobar was down. I saw no indications of that. It's always possible that someone made a great shot like that from a distance, but the Colombian National Police had tremendous incentive to kill Pablo Escobar. Nobody wanted to see him arrested again. And besides that, Escobar, in the course of this manhunt, had killed scores of the, of the policemen who were searching for him. So there was a tremendous amount of anger and hatred in these men searching for him. So it makes more sense to me that Escobar was knocked down by a few bullets from a distance and that he was finally killed with a coup de grace. Some believe that the final blow was actually delivered by an American. Within the Delta Force community, there's sort of a legend about Escobar's death, which holds that he was killed by Delta Force. It was not so much a victory for Delta, but a victory for the whole special ops community. Delta Force would, would have known Pablo's general location at the same time that the search block did and would have had an opportunity to place snipers in that neighborhood. When Pablo came running out on the rooftop, given the marksmanship of a Delta sniper, it's not beyond the possible that, that uh, an American from a distance put that bullet in Escobar's right ear. I think the most likely explanation is that Escobar was killed by the Colombian National Police, by the search block. They had every capability and every desire to see Pablo Escobar dead themselves. There were no Americans involved in it. That was the Colombian National Police taking care of business. The legacy of the Los Pepe's death squad has cast an even darker shadow on the history of the hunt. There's ample evidence today that the search block and the Los Pepes worked hand in hand. And of course, the whole Colombian search block was a creature of the U.S. government, essentially, because they were funded and trained and led by U.S. Special Forces. 
Podrías decir que tácitamente. Los Pepes worked with the tacit cooperation of the U.S. government. The Colombian authorities did not oppose us either. The members of Centrospike who have interviewed said that there was never any doubt in their mind that there was a direct connection between the information that they were collecting and the information that Los Pepes were acting upon. So there's very little question in my mind that the effort to track down Escobar was a collaboration between the United States government, the Colombian National Police, and Los Pepes. I never saw any evidence that it was a Colombian government operation. Um, it, it, was, it was a bloodbath, though. It truly was. Los Pepes. The Pepes operated on their own accord by themselves. For Martinez to say that there was no, I mean, there was no connection there, you know, I mean, I, he can say whatever he wants to, but uh, there was a connection. And in my opinion, the greatest damage caused to the Medellin cartel and to Pablo Escobar and his organization was done by the Los Pepes. The Pepes were not a factor in what we were there to do, but were they a factor in getting Pablo? Yeah, big time. Today, Pablo's place as the world's king of cocaine has been taken over by the Marxist rebel movement known as FARC. FARC guerrillas are responsible for over 70% of the cocaine that reaches the streets of America. And like Pablo Escobar, they have waged a campaign of terror against the Colombian state. The FARC has inherited a lot of the methods that uh, Escobar used, the car bombs, the kidnappings, uh, the terrorism, the terrorist against the civilians. So in that sense, uh, they're looking very much alike, <laughs> unfortunately, for Colombia. As America supports Colombia in its war against the FARC guerrillas, they may once again share a dark ally. I am the leader of the AUC. We exist to fight the FARC guerrillas because the state is not strong enough to fight them themselves. Carlos Castaño has admitted that he was one of the early members of Los Pepes. He, of course, has gone on to become one of the right-wing paramilitary leaders in Colombia. With the tacit support of the Colombian army, the AUC has waged a dirty war against the FARC allegedly massacring thousands of civilians deemed sympathetic to the FARC guerrillas. He's regarded by many Colombians as a hero, but also by many as a violent criminal. There's a real close relationship between the Colombian army and the AUC, in the same way that there was a relationship between the Los Pepes and the police. You know what I'm saying? Like Los Pepes, the AUC has officially been denounced by the U.S. and placed on its list of terrorist organizations. But I suspect that just as in the case with Los Pepes, the uh, paramilitary units will continue to do what they've always done because ultimately it's going to benefit the United States government and the Colombian government in their war against the guerrillas. I think they're a necessary evil. As long as they're the enemy of my enemy, they're going to stay alive and functioning. As Colombia and America square off against the worst enemies they've ever faced, Los Pepes provide a keen example of the central dilemma of modern so-called discretionary warfare. The issue of the Los Pepes, it's one of the central ethical issues involved whenever you use military force, and that is how far are you willing to go to succeed? When you make the decision to go to war, you've essentially decided that the situation is beyond the bounds of normal law and order. When the people are terrorists, but they have a good network, uh, it's very difficult to catch them. I mean, the U.S. has seen that uh, recently with bin Laden. When a person has a clandestine organization, it's not, it's not easy. You're facing an enemy who's trying to kill you. In those kind of circumstances, the ultimate goal is to succeed, is to win, not to necessarily play by the rules. In fact, sometimes the circumstances will force you to play by the same kinds of tactics that your enemy is using in order to prevail. While most Colombians have lived with it for their entire lives, most Americans have only recently known the reality of terror. I think that Americans have to steel themselves to the reality of war, that if you're going to war, you have to face up to the ugly facts about what war is. 